Hi, Bill. This is Eric Larson. How are you? I'm okay. Good, good. Thanks for talking with me at such short notice. No, no problem. I was, I was off today, so... I run fretlessbass.com, and so I'm constantly reaching out to different bass players and different musicians trying to piece some stories together, and I was recently discussing that Pill album album, and uh, I thought it would be fun to ask you a few questions about that project and just get your perspective. Yeah. My site is based around fretless bass, and there's a few songs on there that have some really nice fretless, so I thought it would be good to talk to you about the process and who played what on that, how it came together. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that project. I pretty much played the whole album. I think Jonas plays a solo somewhere. I know he played something. And Malachi Favors plays acoustic bass. So he plays a simple line somewhere. Otherwise, I cut all the tracks with the drummer. Most of the tracks were cut before Don Lydon even arrived in New York. I use some space now on everything. I have a Fender that's got kind of bizarre custom-made bass, and I can't even recall who made it. It was kind of in storage, and one day I pulled it out, and I really liked the tone of it. So I, I've been using that for a long time. The bass on Hill, I believe, is a wall bass, W-A-L, which was made in England. And they're in good condition and maintained. They had a kind of interesting tone. Did you play fretless on all the tracks? I think it's the same bass on all of them, yeah. And, you know, once I started using fretless lately, and, well, actually going pretty far back, there's, a, there's been a lot of experience playing with musicians from other kind of cultures that play what you'd call, I guess, non-tempered instruments. So the tuning is never precise. So if you play with somebody in Morocco who's playing a gimbri or a centia or this bass instrument, if you play live, the tuning changes. So with the fretless bass, you can always kind of follow the tuning. So anybody who's playing these non-tempered instruments, it, it, you couldn't really do it with the fretted bass. That's where the fretless, for me, really makes a big difference. Do you play fretless primarily? It's mainly this one Fender bass now. And lately I've been using an, uh, an eight string and that's for more like improv music and louder things. And the 90% is the Fender fretless bass. I believe it's a 76, but it's had, it's had a lot of work done on it. And it's a mutant. If I didn't own it, it would probably be worth nothing. And I, I think it goes back to a guy called Ken Parker. He made the Parker fly. He was doing a lot of work at that time. I used to get him to invent things and, and help fix things. and. He made me a, a fretless sitar bass that resonates like a sitar, but it's four string fretless, which I still have. And I use that a lot when I was working with Indian music and, and in India. Not lately, uh, but I, I believe he might be one of the people that, that helped put this fretless together. But I used to have a lot of instruments and they were just in storage, and when he pulled that one out, and I didn't really remember the origin, but it sounded great, so I started using it on everything. But it's, you know, this bass is, like I said, it's weird. It has markers, so if you respect markers it doesn't have to sound exactly like a fretless bass right you can have pretty much perfect intonation if you want to on it yeah and if you use a little slight vibrato against the marker you get like what's sort of like a chorus almost like an acoustic chorus effect a phasing thing you know it's, it's real subtle the bass sounds on that album are great i actually like the slide work that you do yeah especially in a song like rise i wanted to bring that out because rise is kind of it's a hybrid it's based on south african music and in the south african music the record that i sort of emulated is totally out of tune so it's again dealing with not only non-tempered instruments you know sometimes you're trying to kind of uh, emulate something that's badly made like a guitar that has bad intonation a bass that doesn't stay in tune and it's all this kind of i guess ethnic sound and so rise is a kind of hybrid of that South African sound and a little bit of Irish influence and, and referencing the early pills first two records. Did John Lydon have demos of these songs? You know, what happened was we talked and we, we had worked together before. I knew him before. And we agreed to make a record. So he's in California and he has, I think it was two or three musicians, I think maybe two guitars. And we were kids, they were like 20 years old. And, but a week before they arrived, I cut three tracks that I just sort of wrote and made up. And I cut them live with the guitarist named Nicky Scopolitis, and the drummer was Tony Williams. And we cut them like one take, you know, and just, we, we sat on it, and it's okay, this is the beginning of the record. And then when John arrived with his musicians, we realized we couldn't really use the musicians, and I would play with, on well, the rest of it was Ginger Baker. I think it was four songs he did. After that, there were these foundations, and then from there I started to just build onto what was there, the foundation. So adding guitar here and there, adding violin, keyboard, whatever, but doing it kind of spontaneous, 
and in the sense improvise. It's almost like hip hop where you start with the beat and then you decorate the beat and then you put the vocal. So once the songs became songs built out of this intuitive improv, and then he came in and he did the, the lyrics. He had a notebook full of words, and we would just experiment with the different sections of words on the different pieces of music. So he was going to play guitar, and I said, well, we'll, you know, we'll be fine. I got this guy, he's kind of up and coming. His name is Steve Vai, and I think it'll be fine. When it was time to do the vocal, he came in. Once that was done, we mixed it, and that was that. It's a classic uh, creation, the, the way it was done. It's totally crazy. At the end of the day, there's a kind of camaraderie, a sensibility that works between the musicians and we we did develop the sound based on these references and it put together a lot of unique musicians some from the past and some that were getting ready to be really big and El Shankar and Ryuichi Sakamoto uh, Bernie Worrell Ginger Baker Tony Williams Steve Vai it's crazy so Steve Vai was would you say he was just coming up at that time you know the name but it was mostly a buzz amongst guitarist. Nobody really knew who he was, but the guitar players knew, you know, the ones that were trying to go in that direction. He did an EP of his own. I think he had played with Zappa. He had had a brief moment in a band called Alcatraz. And I think that was about it. Maybe he was getting ready to do something that was going to blow up around that time. How did you meet Steve I? Through guitarists. You know, people, I just kept hearing his name and um, everybody saying you should hear this guy. And I said, well, when he's in New York, just tell him to call and that maybe there's a session and it happened he was in town around that time. One of my favorite solos is Steve Vai's solo on Ease. Yeah, that's a one take solo, no edit. That was an electric lady upstairs. That was the last overdub of the music before we were ready to look forward to the vocal recording. So that night was the last recording and that solo was probably the last thing we recorded on the record. And I remember it's a long solo and halfway through he threw his guitar up in the air kind of and it came back down and there's kind of a sliding sound that you can hear if you listen to the solo. And right when he threw the guitar in the air, the door opened and it was John who had figured out what studio we were at. And then they both kind of made eye contact and then Steve kept soloing. And then, you know, John was drunk and he was dancing around and he was loving it. But um, Steve just continued and he finished the song. So we just, we wrapped it up and I believe that was the last music recording before we went to the vote. Wow, that's a great story. Great story. I mean, that solo is, it's incredible. It's, it's very, but you know, with Steve, we, you know, he would talk a lot about different guitarists and, and things, and right before he would take a solo, I would get headphones and like a cassette, I believe in those days it was a cassette machine, and I would play him like uh, North African music or trance music from India. I would just say, listen to this for a minute. And then, you know, he would say, yeah, this is cool, I'll totally into it. And I'd say, okay, take off the headphones and I'll play the solo. You know, so so his his references weren't what they would have been. He wasn't thinking about metal or or uh, whoever he liked and rock or Jimi Hendrix or whatever. He was gone. He was kind of lost in this other world of, of of sound and music. That's amazing. I love to hear stories like that. And you know, to this day, that's one of his favorite um, intuitive kind of off the wall crazy solos. I, he's uh, he's always mentioned that since that time. It's been a long time. Yeah. So I mean, this is what 1985, 86, no, a little later, but 86? maybe 86. 86, yeah, I think. Yeah. That's right. When you put down the bass tracks, did you piece these things together or did you have, you know, a small group of musicians in there? I think I recorded the guitar line and then I recorded the bass with a click track. And then I, we set up the drums at the power station, but we put them in the elevator shaft instead of the recording room. It was in where they put like a thing that brings cars up to the parking lot on the roof and we can be shut down the roof and put Tony Williams' drums in an elevator shaft. That's why that big sound is there. And then I played the guitar and the click track. I muted the original bass, and I cut the bass live with Tony. And we did first takes on every piece, I believe. Uh, and on Rise, Tony dropped a beat, and I hit also a half-step wrong note. And when we came back in, we said, you know, we messed up these two parts, but we can fix the drum. So we just took a sampler, which those days we had a fair light, so you just sample the drum and drop it on the hold of the one beat he dropped out. And that's fine, the drums are done. And then I looked at the bass, which is a half step out. I said, you know what? It's a first take, this is classic, so we're gonna keep it. So everybody that overdubbed, I would always say, now when you get to this part, it's a little different. You know? I didn't want to do it because it was a first take. It's totally stupid, and it has nothing to do with composition or music, but it was more to do with not touching it. Right, and you're capturing the moment, literally. Yeah, well, it's one note. I mean, it would have been easy to fix, but for some reason, I just decided, let's let that go, it's gonna be great. So you redid most of the bass lines with the drummer then and kept those. 
that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I, I kept everything that I played, and I didn't even go back and ever listen to the original guy because I wanted it to be with the drums, and not necessarily just playing in time, but something that would bounce a little bit with the drums. Ginger Baker and Tony Williams, are they sort of half and half on the album? Tony did three songs, the first three that we did, and Ginger, I believe, did four. Okay. Yeah. And where did you where did you record Ginger Baker? Same studio. Those days was um, Power Station on the west side here. It was you know Power Station was the famous studio at that time. The engineer was Jason Casaro, and Jason was really famous for doing drum recordings. He's the guy who did the, the big drums of the '80s. You know the Power Station band and uh, all the anytime you get his big gated drums in the '80s, that was Jason. Ginger, we tried him in the parking lot, but it was too. The big, and we decided to use them in the open room, which is a great room anyway. It's classic recording that I feel like, you know, doesn't happen all that often anymore. And no, just, not at all. Not, you know, not like that. It, just experimenting with physical spaces. Today, it just, it seems like it doesn't happen. Do you still do that kind of thing in, in when you're yes, recording? Yes, definitely. And I do, and I, and I still work with Jason, you know, sometimes whenever I can. He has a great room in Jersey. There's a studio in London called the Townhouse. It's a small room, all brick, a very high ceiling. And that's where you you hear uh, like the record of Phil Collins that has the classic uh, Tom Phil. Yeah, in the air tonight, I think. Yeah, that's right. But, but that that drum sound is from Townhouse, and Jason's room in Jersey is so it's very similar to the Townhouse. Occasionally, we go out and use that room for drums. When you were recording the bass on this particular album for Pill, when you did those lines, were you using an amp or were you going direct in? Well, there was I believe there was an Ampeg SVT, um, not even a vintage one. It was a relatively new. Was a, there was a head and there was a cabinet which had pins in it, I think, and then there was, of course, a DI. And uh, if knowing them, it's probably a really special DI, probably a tube DI or something. And, and then you have two channels, and then you just get a balance that, that you like, and that's the sound. Did you treat the bass with effects at all? Not on, not on that uh, record. Compression after the fact, stuff like that? Well, Jason has always compression on everything, but it's subtle. You you wouldn't see it as compression. It kind of just evens things out. And, of course, they have really good compressors, so it's not the cheap stuff. Cheap compressors, you can hear it right away. It just squeezes the life of it. Something really good, and, and with somebody who knows what they're doing, it, it's subtle, and you, it just smooths things out. It depends on how you play, too. So if you're pretty consistent in terms of pressure, you almost don't ever need compression. So that album was done fairly quickly, within a few weeks? Yeah, um, I would say the drum drum and bass things were done in probably three days. Uh, the music overdubs probably in about ten days. And the vocals probably in about five days. And the mixing about a week. And we, we didn't rush on anything, and we didn't waste any time, and we didn't lose any time. Are there any other projects that your fretless bass playing stands out to you or that you, that you find most no, there's, interesting? There's probably a lot. I did a solo record using one of those Warwick, it's a fretless acoustic bass, and I only used that bass on the whole record, it's just that, and nothing else, no instruments, just the bass and a few harmonic overdubs from the same bass. It's called Means of Deliverance. Yeah, that should be available somewhere online. In fact, you know, if you go to our websites and um, MOD Technology, the, the Facebook and websites, it'll, it'll show and mention all these projects, and there's fretless bass on all kinds of stuff. Do you take any time off? Uh, well, it's all time off, really, you know, if you think about it. I get that, true. If you if you are loving what you're doing, you're right. The only danger is if I'm not working, I always feel like I should be working. That's all I've really done. And I get a little guilty if I'm not actually manifesting something. So if I'm not working, I try to invent some idea that has to create some project that's going to come up soon. Well, I'll, I'll let you go for now. I really appreciate you talking with me here last minute like this in such short notice. No, no problem. Thanks very much, Bill. Have a good night. All right, bye-bye.